this is the last session of uh, the successful day, I must say. And what we would like to do is, uh, I'm going to ask my friend Yasin Anwar to uh, say a few things uh, that based on what he has heard. And then, uh, after he has spoken for five minutes or so, I have a couple of uh, uh, questions and issues that I would like to have him get involved in. Uh, and then we'll open it uh, to other people, to the floor. Yasin, <coughs> do you want to start with? Uh, Excellency, Ambassador and Mr. Bertie, of course. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. I should give you a little bit of uh, reason why I'm here. It's because the gentleman sitting next to me. I'm, uh, I was here on a very discreet, low-flying uh, uh, holiday to uh, visit my family. My wife is a, a research fellow at uh, NUS. And uh, lo and behold, um, the radar of uh, Mr. Berkey caught me and uh, arm twisted me into coming as though I could not say no because I have a great deal of respect and admiration for him. And I've known him for a long time. And uh, I should say that uh, I, I, I do espouse some of his, uh, uh, his views uh, for a long time. And uh, one of the points that he mentioned uh, earlier was about women. And I remember in the 19, uh, mid to late 80s when I was on the board of directors of the U.S. Pakistan Economic Council in New York, uh, Mr. Berkey came and he mentioned something about that. And I'll quote him so I won't page a little plagiarize it. He mentioned that, how can we as a nation progress when 50% of our population is in a non-productive capacity? Am I quoting you correctly? And I believe in that too. Um, also, I also believe in that uh, the challenges we face and the negatives that we face are there, as are in many countries uh, of the developing world. But then again, as I agree with him also, that uh, the positives should not be overlooked. Because in my view, the positives outweigh the negatives. And uh, I cite the earlier speakers who talked about how they had a personal agenda in coming back to Pakistan, why they came back, because they saw opportunity. Well, I have a similar reason. Uh, as uh, uh, Moza mentioned, and as, as uh, I've already mentioned, I came from the private sector. Um, worked at J.P. Morgan Chase in New York, uh, 15 years after that with Bank of America and Merrill Lynch in New York and London. And I came to join the Central Bank in 2007 as a deputy governor. And uh, the reason I came is because I saw an opportunity. Uh, and it took me five months to accept the position when it was uh, offered to me and I was approached. I did not have a CV made up. But I thought long and hard. And I took that decision because I, I saw a light at the end of the tunnel. And I can say I did not see that light as an oncoming locomotive. So, so far, I have had no regrets. But one of the things that uh, Mr. Berkey mentioned earlier, and I want to just capsulize a couple of items. He mentioned that I have not listened to him uh, uh, on, on a couple of areas, the agriculture and SME sectors, which he pointed out very correctly. Uh, but I've been on the driver's seat here only for about 10 months, so uh, I, I have started in that 10 months, Mr. Berkey, in that these two or three areas, I do believe in very, uh, very much so. Uh, the three engines of growth of any economy are the agricultural, SME, and the real estate. Uh, if you, some of you know the United States, uh, California as a state itself in the 60s, 70s, 80s, was the fifth largest economy in the world. It's because of these three sectors, uh, agricultural, SME, and, uh, and uh, real estate. Uh, real estate I won't touch on because we have a long way to go before we um, establish the fixed income market, which was mentioned earlier, the capital markets that have to be set up. Because Pakistan has huge potential, but our outstanding in the banking sector for real estate is only about 1% of GDP. In the United States, is 65% and 110% in the UK. Of course, that is an area that we need to develop, and we are working with the SSCP uh, very, very actively to see if we can develop over the next couple of years the yield curve up to 25 years so we can provide a fixed income market. But on the agricultural side, it is the engine of growth. 22% of our GDP, 45% of our workforce. And yes, it's already been touched upon how we are the fourth or fifth largest milk producer in the world. And our cows produce a little over 1,000 liters a very year. Um, Australian cows produce about five, six, seven thousand, 7,000. And US cows produce about 10,000 liters per annum. Well, that's, that's because genetically they've been producing uh, and capturing those cows for, for a century or more. But Engro, as was mentioned earlier, 
Nestle and other entities have started importing these cows and are beginning to produce these, uh, capitalize on this opportunity. And uh, look at New Zealand and uh, Denmark, they're small producers, but they export a lot of their dairy products. I feel that Pakistan has the potential of producing about 500 million to a billion dollars in export revenue from exporting these dairy products eventually. That's the opportunity that exists. I know one company in, in, um, in Sin is producing homogenized, pasteurized milk, state-of-the-art equipment, computerized, very small manpower, but it's providing milk to the uh, Karachi or the Sin province. Shelf life is three, three days. That tells you the freshness and the kind of facilities that they have. And there are partners that they are looking at from overseas, particularly from Saudi Arabia, and developing uh, partnerships in exploiting this area a bit more. Uh, one of the areas that wasn't touched on, and I, it's my pet peeve, of course, is the banking sector. You know, the world world has gone through a global crisis. And I won't talk about the subprime business because that's, a, that's an area that you already know about. But look at the carnage that's taken place in the, uh, in the globe. Well, fortunately, the Pakistan banking sector was very resilient. We did not have a single collapse of a particular institution. Right? We had no derivatives products because, first of all, I don't understand these opaque products myself when I've been working at Merrill Lynch, and I'm not sure if the regulators in the United States or Europe understood them either. And there's still, the carnage is still continuing. Look at this LIBOR crisis. Does anyone know how much is outstanding based on LIBOR in terms of loans and securities? If not, let me tell you, it's $800 trillion, trillion dollars of exposure in these LIBOR-based instruments. It's not over yet. We've got $69 trillion or so of, of, of uh, market cap of the global economy. It's huge, and lawsuits that are going to come out have yet to flow out through. Well, fortunately, the banking sector in Pakistan is not subject to this. <clears throat> Our returns have been very, very attractive in the sector. The spreads have been attractive. You've got the risk-reward ratio, of course, that you look at. Our capital adequacy ratio is about 14%, whereas the international standard is about 8 to 10%. We're well cushioned uh, to meet with the Basel III Accords, which kick in around 2019. We're already up to speed in some of those requirements. So Basel II, we fully are compliant. So we're very conservative in that area, and we provide a great deal of opportunity for offshore investors to come in. Some people have talked about some investors multinational selling out to local companies. Well, conversely, we've got other institutions in the bank sector that are coming in. Just to give you an idea, the largest bank in the world, ICBC, Industrial Commercial Bank of China, has opened its doors in Pakistan. They've opened two branches, they're going to open a couple more. This was last year. Huge entity. They have got huge opportunities to finance not only the Chinese companies, but other projects in Pakistan. Another large bank, largest Turkish bank, Ishbankaz, has already decided to come here. They're bidding on HSBC branches, but they, if they don't get that, they'll still open branches uh, in our backyard. Thirdly, there's another Turkish bank that is considering coming to Pakistan because there are opportunities that they see. There's another large, I, come, I can't give the name out right now, but they've come and see me. They're waiting for board approval. One of the top 10 banks in the world is also considering opening its doors in Pakistan. These are some of the positives that I, I like to hi highlight in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that do exist and those people who, as Mr. Munir mentioned, know how to navigate. And, and uh, I'll, he explained it very well, but you know, one of the key components of navigation is patience. Uh, patience is important. It's the old risk-reward ratio. Ultimately, people who are understand, understand the market, who understand the multinational environment, understand the relationship building, understand the bureaucracy, which exists in every country in the world. You can navigate successfully and get attractive returns like Engroves and Abbott's and others have, uh, have, have uh, experienced. Now, one very important point, Pakistan has gone through a turbulent ro roller coaster ride. Look in the 90s, late 90s, when we had about $100 million in reserves. Even though in difficult times, Pakistan has never, ever defaulted on repatriation of multinational corporations' dividends that have been paid out. It's a very powerful statement. ICIs and Ibots and others have never had difficulties with repatriation of uh, the profits. So if you're an offshore investor, that is a comfort level that you can, they can, you can uh, uh, identify with. Um, they, they're, I, I, I mentioned about the uh, banks coming in. There are a couple of other investors that are coming in. I was in Saudi Arabia just last month. And uh, lo and behold, Saudis have uh, a couple of the private sector institutions or, or companies that are huge uh, by Pakistan standards 
and by Singapore standards. Uh, they have market caps or, or net worths in excess of $15 billion, some of them. Uh, they're considering investing in the agricultural sector as well as in some of the banking sector. So you've got some positive uh, feedback that's uh, coming in the fold. I heard, of course, there's a lot of corruption in Pakistan. Well, where isn't there corruption? I worked many years in New York, and I saw a lot of corruption there. I worked a lot of years in London, 10 years in London before I moved here. 14 years in New York, I can tell you the corruption that I saw in Fermi, in Berry Hill and Wall Street. But look what's happening. Mr. Madoff, who made off with $50 billion. And I cite more and more anti-money laundering schemes. Look at the banks that have been identified. Well, Pakistan has a standard of anti-money laundering schemes that are much higher than Western standards in the United States or England. I can vouch for that because nobody has been able to challenge me, the U.S. Treasury, OFAC, or anybody in the uh, United States or England will come to see me. If not. Okay, very good. I'll just wrap up there. Those are the positives that I just wanted to highlight before, uh, since some of the uh, gentlemen had talked about it before. I'll leave the floor open to questions. To get the conversation going, Yassin, one question I have, which is, uh, you know, this is not a very mature political system in Pakistan. Uh, last time, the Mujahidah government uh, decided to hold general elections, they went wide. They cheapened the money somehow. They used the fiscal system to to pump in a lot of money. Your biggest challenge is going to be to control those kinds of impulses, to make sure that uh, they don't bankrupt the economy in order to win the elections. What are you going to do in order to be able to do that? I, I knew this was going to be a tough <laughs> uh, place to be when I'm sitting next to Mr. Murphy. I think this is the toughest uh, uh, questioner that I could possibly come across uh, on the world. Um, good question. Um, you know, uh, there's, uh, I'm not infallible. Um, and uh, a central bank, as a, as a central bank, we have, of course, our own uh, rules and regulations and parameters under which we operate uh, under the State Bank Act. Um, unfortunately, and I understand we're under Chatham House rules, um, you know, I was misquoted by the Wall Street Journal uh, about a couple of months back, so uh, I want to uh, carefully say that uh, the State Bank Act, uh, unfortunately, from my own personal comfort level, is not uh, the kind of tightly knit act that I would like to see. And perhaps we're going to move towards that in due course, because uh, it does not provide me with the complete independence and the control mechanisms that enables me to um, to control the uh, borrowing uh, that Mr. Berkey was alluding to from the fiscal side. The, the, the three basic challenges that I see that Pakistan has, um, one is revenues, uh, balance of payments, and private sector credit. You fix the first one, and the others fall into place. Um, the uh, uh, revenue side requires, obviously, what Mr. Berkey mentioned earlier about the low tax to GDP ratio of 8.5%. That is a major task that we have to address, without which we're not going to be able to uh, meet our fiscal deficit targets. Um, you know, we have uh, the United States at about uh, 28%, European countries about 40%. Uh, we have not done very well there. and how. I can bounce a check. Well, which um, central bank bounces the uh, government's check? I, I don't have the authority to do that, frankly speaking. Uh, and furthermore, uh, yes, and we do. We've done that. We've got ways and means limits uh, of provincial governments, and we do. We have bounced those. But many times, the fiscal authorities come up and give them a little bit of a flexible leeway in the last 24 hours. That happens too. Now, the problem we've had there in uh, some of the, um, uh, the borrowings, of course, is that the NFC awards that were um, allocated a couple of years back well, allocated the uh, federal budget uh, to the provinces. Unfortunately, the provinces have not met their uh, deficit targets or the surplus targets that they were expecting. So as a result, the borrowings have gone through the roof. How, how do you control that? Uh, frankly speaking, I, I don't have an answer to 
to say yes emphatically that we can control it. What we have done is very, very actively in our monitoring policy statements. Uh, every two months, we have a uh, twice a year uh, press conference, and every two months, we have a monitoring policy statement, which has highlighted, if you look back, in the last 10 months to a year, we've highlighted very actively um, this particular area, that the areas that must be controlled in order for us to see sustainable economic development is this area, fiscal management or fiscal mismanagement. And the borrowings must be stopped, otherwise it is inflationary. Um, so, uh, to in a roundabout way, I'm not sure if I can uh, be honest about it, but this is an area that we have highlighted repeatedly in our quarterly reports and our annual reports, and I think they've been quite hard-hitting. Uh, I've been beaten up quite badly, by the way, in, by certain quarters about being critical about the uh, fiscal borrowings that have been very heavy. So, uh, we're going to continue that, and we'll keep a tight belt on the provincial borrowings as well. Little bit mischievous. Uh, when, we, when we had dinner last night, you said to me, uh, we were talking about uh, getting together in Islamabad, and you said, I go to Islamabad every week. Uh, when I was briefly finance minister of Pakistan, uh, you, one of your predecessors used to come to Islamabad three times a week. And I said to him, why do you come to Islamabad three times a week? You are an autonomous uh, part of the government. You need to stay in Karachi and do whatever you want to do. You don't have to come and consult the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance is not your boss. It's friends like you who needs enemies. <laughs> Well, you know, the Wall Street Journal did quote me accurately there, and I stand by it. I am not as independent as I would like to be. For example, on the borrowing side, I would have liked to see 10% on the revenue side as a restriction, and as some countries have it. I'm not there three times a week, and I don't even go very often to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, hence, I don't think they particularly like me. Um, but no, I am a very, very staunch independent uh, thinker, independent um, operator as far as the state bank is concerned. Uh, the autonomous status of the state bank is there to some degree, uh, albeit, as I mentioned earlier, not as watertight as I would like to see. For example, the borrowing side. The government does require zeroing out the quarterly borrowings. Granted, they failed last quarter. But there is, a, under the uh, State Bank Act and the new amendments, they're required to wind down the borrowings that have accumulated over the next seven years down to zero. And if they do exceed the quarterly borrowings or the annual borrowings at the end of the year, they must, again, this is a, a memo or an explanation the finance minister has to uh, provide to the parliament as to why they breached that borrowing. But then again, the memo is perhaps worth the paper it's on, but it is something that is a caveat that's been built in. So independent, yes, to the extent where I don't travel as frequently to Islamabad, um, not independent enough to be able to bounce those checks. First of all, HSBC, you mentioned, is pulling out not because of Pakistan specific. Um, it is a regional, it's a global uh, deleveraging that the process they're going through. They're pulling out of Chile, from New Zealand, uh, as well as Pakistan. So it's purely uh, part of their overall strategy given what's happening in the Eurozone crisis. You know that. The cost of capital has gone up and they need to maintain capital to maintain those ratios that are upcoming. And there's more nonsense to come out of the Eurozone crisis. And I can go on to stories about what will happen there in the coming months and years, as well as the U.S., uh, but that's a topic for a separate uh, session. Um, so that is not Pakistan-specific. Citibank is not pulling out. In fact, they just uh, reduced their commitment to a particular sector, the credit card and consumer areas, where they weren't as, uh, they couldn't commit resources, perhaps, to build that business. Why? Because of, obviously, what's going on in the United States and Citibank itself. So it's not Pakistan-specific again. <coughs> Uh, as far as 
extrication of, of the, that bank, well, you've got more coming in. So the numbers outweigh, the new entrants outweigh the new ones, uh, the, old, the old ones that are, are going out. So I think you'll find that these particular institutions have a whole team of clients from their own countries that are making out of the country. The Turkish construction companies are coming to see us as well. They're making uh, some, uh, uh, they're, they're in fact bidding on certain contracts. Same thing with the Chinese companies, Huawei and other companies, major telecommunications companies. The, three, the main sector, of course, is the power sector and the uh, telecommunications sectors. And these are companies that are major in their own home term, and their banks, they're following the banks, and vice versa, because they want to bind their client base to their own network. That's a traditional pattern of any international bank, and you'll find more coming in. If you consider Standard Chartered, which is actually a localized bank, because they're incorporated there, but let's consider that as a foreign bank, for intents and purposes. Uh, I, I'd say they're about uh, 30%, 25 to 30%, because you've got a deposit base of five largest banks, so the Pakistani bank, 65% control of the deposit base. Uh, I think Pakistan is very lucky, unlike your neighbor, where the root they are seem to be volatile and probably on the downward trend. So what role does the state bank play in controlling your national currency? Do you get support from the government or the private sector in maintaining the parity of the, of the Pakistani uh, currency? You know, exchange rate stability is always a tough one, and as a, uh, to follow as an economist, uh, Mr. Berkey would vouch for that. Uh, to, uh, you know, in the last two, three months, keep in mind, last two, three months, uh, the, the currency depreciations in this part of the world is not by those countries specifically. It's because of the Eurozone and the dollar play. For example, there's one week where the Pakistan rupee depreciated by a few percentage points. It was the fourth uh, currency, fourth largest in the world that depreciated, but the first was one. Sterling, Eurozone, Euro, as well as one of the currencies. All the other SARC countries also depreciated similarly. Why? Because of the play on the dollar <coughs> euro crisis. Uh, the Pakistan rupee has depreciated to the extent of about 6-7% in the last year. Um, now, we have not, as a central bank, been aggressively intervening. That's not our philosophy. Our policy is to ensure that, that, that speculative hits on the, exchange, on the exchange rate are managed properly. And that's how we manage it. There's no targeting of uh, exchange rate that we undertake. Uh, we have fine-tuned the banking system to some degree. And given my own banking background, there are some financial institutions that were playing the short and long game. So we just restricted our import cover to a certain level so they can't deviate or play that game. Treasurer, if you were treasurer, you would do the same thing. But I know what they do. Some, most, of these, most of the people work with me in, in my previous life. So I know the game that they're playing. So we just cut that tap off. So we've got relative stability in the last year or two, as you can see, it's appreciated a bit. Why? Because we had coalition support funds of 1.18 billion that came in that helps our balance, help the balance of payments position. Dr. Joseph, uh, thank you, Dr. Nam, for uh, very insightful uh, uh, remarks uh, uh, with regard to uh, the monetary policy and your uh, Pakistan economy. As you know, I'm from Bangladesh, and uh, uh, I was very pleased to hear very positive statements with regard to the general and nature of the Pakistan economy and the potential of the Pakistan economy. So this is very useful. The question I want to ask you is a very short one. It's, a, it's a, also specific. It's with regard to Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves. Now, uh, how do you use them? Do you buy uh, treasury bonds? Or do um, you think, or, uh, are there any thoughts on uh, some out of the book? thinking with regard to using them more effectively than just buying bonds at 1%, 1.2%. Uh, well, you know, as a central bank, we're, as, a, as Bangladesh or any central bank would be concerned, we invest in very liquid blue chip instruments, and that's where we invest in. Keep in mind, we are also uh, uh, under an IMF facility, so there are conditionalities that we have. So we would be restricted in terms of our own flexibility in terms of moving our reserves uh, in 
exotic uh, products or instruments uh, that we wouldn't do otherwise in any case. Uh, but our reserves at the moment uh, uh, are about 15.6 billion. And, uh, and uh, we have about 2.9 billion of IMF payments that we have to make for this fiscal year. We have no problems in making those payments. To generate uh, some additional reserves, we have some irons in the fire. I mean, I personally have some irons in the fire that will perhaps generate some additional inflows during the course of the year, perhaps in the second half. And that is directly tied and indirectly also to the currency swap agreements that we've executed with China and Turkey and the others that are in the pipeline as well. China's benchmarked at 1.5 billion, Turkey at 1 billion as they operationalize, which is going to be Turkey, going to be, it's going to be next month, China by the end of this month, end of the year. That is tantamount to saving some foreign exchange reserves. So these are kind of alternative mechanisms that we're developing to try and preserve and build on our reserves, uh, these kinds of swap agreements. But as far as investing in any other instruments uh, that will give us a better yield, you know, we're getting up the risk curve, and that we're going to be careful. <coughs> Uh, Islamic banking has tremendous potential. It's about, it represents about 6 to 7 percent of our banking assets. Uh, and one of the reasons why it has not grown as rapidly as it should have is because it's modeled after more uh, paralleling conventional banking products. So we need to come up with new creative products and secondly, training and development, human resources, uh, capacity building. That has not been there. We're emphasizing that a great deal. Now, one of the areas that has opened up uh, to Islamic banking potential is the agricultural sector. In the areas that we talked about, and I touched on, and also the, the uh, milk production, for example, that is very Sharia compliant. That has huge potential. As I mentioned, you know, the Middle Eastern Bank is thinking of coming to Pakistan, setting up shop market because of this area. So we see more and more Islamic banking products that will come on as new competition comes into the mainstream. Let me uh, bring this session and this uh, forum to a close. I'd like to recognize three people in particular who have made this uh, a very useful exercise. First, obviously, is uh, uh, Pakistan High Commissioner to Singapore, His Excellency Sayyid Hassan Jaffe, whose idea it is, it was, and uh, was put to work by Imran and by Johnson over there. So thanks to all of you. This has been a productive, stimulating session. It's kept us all uh, busy. We've thought a lot about a difficult situation, a difficult country, but we have also expressed some hope about the future. Uh, my friend Yasi Nanga has done a great job, and I think he deserves a big hand. And good job. Thank you, Mr. Anwar, and thank you, Mr. Berkey. Yes, he does. <laughs> and as a gesture of our appreciation, Mr. Berkey will present a gift on behalf of the organizers to Mr. Anwar. Today's session to a close. It is our great pleasure to invite His Excellency Ambassador Syed Hassan Javid, High Commissioner of Pakistan, to deliver the closing remarks. Your Excellency, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My special thanks to Professor. Tan Tai Yong, uh, who is not here at the moment, and Mr. Karan Singh uh, Takral, Chairman of SBF South Asia. Uh, Honorable Mr. Yasin Anwar, 
Governor of State Bank of Pakistan, Mr. Shahid Javid Burki, former Vice President of World Bank, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Before I thought I go to just some of these, you know, I hate to be the last speaker generally because every, everyone has spoken what I would actually like to speak. So, but, uh, you know, that just uh, to pick up an idea, uh, I haven't really missed uh, articles written by Mr. Shahid Javid Burki all my life, probably 25 or 30 years that I remember. And I told him I agree with him 80%, but not 20%. So, you see, the last article he wrote in State Times, a wonderful article if you have read them, uh, an article which mentions the concept of a nirvana state. Now, I use this nirvana state in a, in, in a different context. Pakistan is not a nirvana state, I think so, because we have an independent media, we have an independent judiciary, and we have a very, very active civil society. What Mr. Berkey has talked of nirvana state of a, of a state where welfare is used as a concept. So sir, allow me to borrow this concept, and I use it in my way, that nirvana concept, nirvana state, too big to fail, too perfect to fail. Pakistan is certainly not a nirvana state. We have, we, we have, we, we are aware of our problems. We do, we know the realities are very complex. And when God was distributing cynicism Probably our people were the first to reach there. <laughs> and, but another good thing that God was distributing when our people also became the first people to reach there, and that was when he was distributing talents. <laughs> so no system is perfect. And you know, whatever perceptions you have have Pakistan doesn't really make a difference on the potential of Pakistan. That's my feeling. And the uh, media or the thick tanks are talking about Pakistan, with the world over, have no impression on Pakistan's potential. Look at the example of China, for instance, for the last three decades. It doesn't really make a difference. What is, actually makes a difference is our own readiness to reform ourselves. There I agree with you, sir. We, are, we, 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 we have governance and policy issues. But even with all this, we have, just today, I was reading Godrej of India deciding to enter Pakistan, Godrej group. And over the last four years, there have been 100 multinationals who have entered Pakistan, and those names I have, a dozen of them, and I could read the names of them, that who have entered Pakistan. El Kurti of Spain, Spanish brand Mango, marketing giant Ispas, IT firm Teradata, British chain store Moda and Pell, Devonham, US clothing chain George NT, New York, and others. So it's not only Pakistanis who are investing in Pakistan. In the last four years, there have been 100 new multinationals who have gone in Pakistan. And those who have been pulled out, uh, a few ones who considered selling their stakes in Pakistan, they have done it not because of reasons of Pakistan, but because of their problems that their own headquarters are facing globally, like the Eurozone crisis and the American debt crisis. So Pakistan is where from they have made 40 to 50 percent profit repatriation this year, after profit after tax. So I just thought I'd make some of these re remarks before going to that. Exports from Singapore to Pakistan grew by 48 percent last year to $2 billion. Or, and Pakistan and Singapore has 16 cooperation agreements. Pakistan ASEAN trade has doubled over the past four years from US dollar four billion to eight billion. Pakistan is importing 70% of its requirements from the Asia Pacific region while exporting only 40% to the Asia Pacific region. Pakistan I consider as the world's next, next star economy going to be. It's most promising emerging market with unbeatable advantages. <coughs> Rate of return in Pakistan's stock market has been the highest in the world in US dollar terms over the past 10 years. 
There have been 1,200% increase in higher, in higher education enrollment in Pakistan, one of the few countries in the world where there have been 1,200% increase in higher education enrollment, and most of it has gone to the female enrollment. The rate of return in Pakistan is 40 to 50 percent, and just last year, the multinationals from Pakistan, they sent back 40 percent profit in dollar terms from Pakistan to their headquarters. We allow 100 percent profit repatriation, as you heard in the speech. We have the second largest O and A level student population after the United Kingdom, and the third largest English speaking force in Asia. Pakistan, I consider as the best bait to beat back recession. And those who did not, who were not in Pakistan, are now reconsidering, given the Pakistan's potential as a, as its sustainable profit, profit destination. So there is this tendency of Pakistan, uh, these firms coming in Pakistan. Pakistan has maintained 5 to 6 percent GDP growth rate for the past 60 years. The rural economy of Pakistan, just as the higher education se sector and the female education that was pointed out, is booming in sectors in Pakistan at the moment. Pakistan's resource endowments are enormous, given the 200 million people, sixth largest country, fourth largest labor force, youngest population of 54% under 19 years, and agriculture, which promises to be a game changer with Rice, 9 million tons of wheat, 7 million tons of wheat, 6 million tons of rice, and sugar available at a time when the, the world at large is going to have some difficulties in food, food, food market next year. Pakistan is well placed. We never had a recession, and we'll never have probably, unless short of a calamitic disaster. Pakistan. Uh, produces what you uh, 33 kinds of fruits, and we only export 5 percent. What you heard in the presentation, Pakistan only adds 2 to 5 percent value addition to its natural resources. So Pakistan has 95 percent still open for all of you, and for the Pakistanis themselves. So we do. We only add. We only export 5 percent of our fruits. We have something what you are seeing, $30 trillion, double the size of US public debt in terms of just mineral resources in Pakistan. The coal of Pakistan is valued at $118 per turn. If you value it, if you, if you calculate that, it comes to 20 decimal $8 trillion, just the coal. Then you have gold in Pakistan. And let me tell you something about gold in Pakistan. I believe we have more gold than any other country in the world. No, not that I believe it. I have seen it. The record reserves in Pakistan are not the quarrying in the water, in the river, river quarrying type of grains of gold. It's not the rock or the boulder gold that you get in South Africa or in Australia. We have walls of gold. And we are the only fortunate country maybe in the world which has the walls which are made of gold, naturally, in Rekodi. There are caves in Rekodi where you can see those gold in the wall full of gold. So Pakistan is the country of the future. We don't, I mean, we certainly we need uh, a, an accelerated rate of growth. And this is what we are all discussing about. Of course, we have 800 multinational companies in Pakistan and the number keeps increasing. Pa pa Pakistan's, you know, the, there has been consensus on the phase three optimistic scenario that you give, sir. The dominant thinking is that Pakistan has a great potential. Quality will come out of quantity in Pakistan. Pakistanis love to do hard things first. We, we in our part of the world, we grew up reading one story as a fable in our childhood, and that is, the tortoise always wins, not the hare. This is the fable that we, we grew up. So Pakistan may be 3%, 4%, or 5%, maybe the tortoise. But it is the tortoise, you know, the patience, and the, what you call the perseverance, that matters. Talent grows in Pakistan more than anything else, let me tell you. 
and our youth are the future. And we are very confident that uh, this, this huge resource bank of the youth that we have will be able to add more than 5% what we have been adding so far in the, in the resource endowments of Pakistan. So I really thank the Institute of South Asian Studies and also the, the uh, Singapore Business Federation for providing this opportunity. We have been actually working for a long time. I have been working to get this opportunity to, to show what Pakistan potential is for our Singaporean friends. Pakistan is not a known country in Singapore. It's known for the wrong reasons. But Pakistan today has been known, and my colleagues tell me, for the right reasons. So this is where I feel a little proud of, of making my own little contribution, which can help. But certainly in this, I, did, I, I, I owe all this to the efforts of our friends, Mr. Imran Nasrullah, and and also of Institute of South Asian Studies and yourself, sir, and all the colleagues and all the panelists and the speakers to make it possible to give a presentation, which is a balanced presentation, but the balance is tilted in favor of phase three of your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's seminar. On behalf of ISAS, the High Commission of Pakistan and Singapore, and SBF, I thank you for your participation and support. If you are keen to have a copy of today's presentations, please do contact either ISAS or SBF. And just a reminder for those who wish to submit the evaluation form, please drop it at the registration table on your way out. Thank you again and have a great evening.